Hello everybody, Shrouded Hand here. I know a lot of premeditation goes into serial killing, and it's easy to envision the crazed killer sat alone at home planning their next murder, but to me the murder kit makes it a whole lot more real. Simply put, these are a killer's toolkit, the equipment that they put together, usually in an easy to carry bag to aid them in taking another person's life. Now you have a tangible set of objects, each one a little glimpse into the mind of a killer. Each object before it was placed into the murder bag, the killer would have held in their hands and thought about how it would be used to murder another human being. Each object would have been an opportunity for the killer to reflect on what they were about to do, and possibly to change their mind. The murder kit is a statement of intent. Once all the items are in the bag, the killing is almost inevitable. So let's take a look at these murder kits and perhaps it'll give us a unique insight into the mind of a serial killer. I'll start with Ted Bundy, because why not? So apparently Zach Baggins of Ghost Adventures fame bought Ted Bundy's murder kit last year. I've no idea how much the bag cost him to buy, but TMZ reports that Baggins has previously shelled out $50,000 for a pair of Bundy's glasses, so I assume the bag and its contents cost a lot more. Most of you watching will already know who Ted Bundy is, so this description is going to be quite brief, and if you wanted to learn more there's a decent documentary on Netflix that I can recommend. Before his execution, Bundy confessed to 30 murders, although it's thought that he probably killed a lot more. He was a handsome and charismatic guy who was able to gain people's trust easily. Often he would pretend to be disabled so that compassionate women would offer to help him carry things like groceries and books back to his car. Once he had them alone, he would knock them unconscious with a blow to the head, then drive them to a secluded location. There he would tie them up and subject them to a prolonged rape and torture before murdering them. He would also stalk university campuses, breaking into students' apartments and sorority houses to abduct and murder them. After killing, Bundy would engage in necrophilic acts with the corpses, often returning to the body repeatedly until it was too decomposed to touch. He would also decapitate some of his victims, and he kept their heads in his apartment. By 1975, he was at the height of his killing spree, and he was getting quite brazen. At this time, he was attending the University of Utah, and he would travel as far as Colorado to commit his murders. Reports began to flood in of a suspicious man with his arm in a sling, asking students to help him carry books to his VW Beetle. Soon afterwards, a similar VW Beetle was spotted in Salt Lake City. When the car refused to stop for a police officer, the driver, Ted Bundy, was arrested and the vehicle was searched. Inside, they found Bundy's murder kit. It was a large black holdall containing all the tools of his trade. There were a lot of rags in the kit, made from a large sheet torn into strips. I assume these were used to restrain and gag his victims, as was the rope, although this might also have been used to strangle them. When people murder for sexual gratification, restraints and strangulation are often employed on the victims. There's also a flashlight, a box of trash bags, and a pair of gloves. Interestingly, it's two different gloves, one leather and one woolen. I'm not really sure why there's two different gloves in there. Maybe he just misplaced the other gloves. Maybe they belong to one of his victims, I'm not sure. The masks are probably the most creepy looking thing there. There's one woolen ski mask and one made from a pair of tights. He probably wore these when he was breaking into people's houses to murder them. The brown ski mask looks shop bought and I can imagine Bundy selecting it in the store, picking out the one that looks the most menacing. Similar to the gloves, I can't work out why he needed two different masks when surely just one would suffice. Maybe he made his victims wear the pantyhose mask in some sort of twisted sex game. Maybe he just wore different masks depending on his mood. Or maybe he wore one mask under the other, I don't know. 
The crowbar pigeon wasn't actually in the bag when he was arrested, it was kept behind his car seat within easy reach. After luring women back to his car, he would reach in and grab the crowbar, then he would smash them over the head with it. Looking at it now, I wonder how many women's skulls were shattered with this very object, and what other torments he inflicted with it. The ice pick is the most sinister object. Every other object seems to have at least some sort of utilitarian purpose, either to incapacitate, restrain or dispose of its victims. The ice pick seems to be there purely as a torture device. We know that Bundy usually strangled or bludgeoned his victims to death, so this isn't a murder weapon. Bundy enjoyed subjecting his victims to a slow and painful death, often torturing them till they were unconscious, then reviving them so that he could inflict more pain. Exactly what he did with this ice pick I don't know for sure, but its presence in the murder bag certainly sends my mind reeling with possibilities. A more recent serial killer with a murder kit is Israel Keyes. He admitted to admiring Ted Bundy, and perhaps this is where Keyes was inspired to make his own murder kit. Exactly when Keyes started killing, or how many victims there were, is unknown. Only three murders have been definitely linked back to him, though like Bundy, it's suspected he killed a lot more. The reason for this is because he was extremely careful and meticulously planned his murders. He lived in Alaska, but when he wanted to kill someone he would fly to a different part of the country, then he would hire a rental car and drive hundreds of miles to another area, only then would he select a victim at random and kill them. A key component to these killings were his murder kits. In waterproof containers he would stash guns and knives, along with chemicals for disposing of the bodies. He would bury these kits in remote locations, then leave them untouched for years. In 2009 he travelled to Essex in Vermont, and buried a bucket containing guns, knives and zip ties. Two years later he travels back to the same area, books himself into a motel and picks out his victims. It was a middle-aged couple named Bill and Lorraine Courier. He picked them because the house was in an isolated location, near to the wooded area where his stash was buried. Sometime after midnight, on the 8th of June 2001, Keyes retrieved his murder kit and broke into the courier's house. Once inside, he restrained the couple with zip ties and drove them to an abandoned farmhouse. Perhaps somewhat mercifully for Bill, he was shot and killed quite quickly but Lorraine was subjected to a much more prolonged death. Keyes tortured and sexually assaulted her for hours before slowly strangling her to death. Afterwards, he disposed of the bodies and they were never found. After that, he moved his murder kit to a new location in Parrishville in New York and it remained there until after his arrest. This tactic of travelling to remote locations and stashing the murder weapons was actually working pretty well. If he'd stuck to this tactic, he might still be at large today. He only really got caught because he got sloppy in the end, choosing to abduct and kill a woman close to where he lived. This was the murder of Samantha Koenig, an 18-year-old woman whose abduction from the coffee stand where she worked was captured on CCTV. I actually cover this in more detail in another video, so I'll put a link at the end if you want to learn more about the murder of Samantha Koenig. Ultimately, this incident led to the arrest of Keyes, and to him confessing to the killing of many more people. He told police that he'd stashed many more murder kits across the country. So far, only two have been recovered. The container in New York that was used to kill the couriers and a plastic bag found in Anchorage containing a shovel and some Drano. Somewhere out there, there are other such kits just waiting for an unsuspecting hiker or inquisitive child to uncover. As I said, the exact number of people that Keyes murdered is unknown, but investigators believe that he killed 11 people. He committed suicide in his cell before any more information could be divulged, although he did leave a clue behind. Eleven skulls, drawn in his own blood, were found stashed under the bunk in his cell.
Another killer who left clues in his artwork was John Sweeney, also known as the Scalp Hunter. After his arrest, police found hundreds of paintings in his home, most of them depicting violent acts. Some of the paintings even had Tipex covering clues that identified some of his murder victims. His first known victim was Melissa Halstead, a girlfriend of Sweeney's who went missing in Amsterdam in 1990. It's rumoured that at the same time he killed two German men who he found in bed with Halstead. When he was finished he cut off Melissa's hands and her head and dumped the torso into a canal. Presumably if he did also kill the two German men that their bodies got the same treatment, although nothing has been found. Melissa's torso was eventually recovered from the canal but it wouldn't be identified until 2003 because of the missing pieces. Her head and hands have never been recovered, although it's thought that he could have stashed them in the walls or the foundations of building sites where he was working. It's quite possible that there are buildings in Amsterdam and other parts of Europe that contain pieces of Sweeney's murder victims. This murder was never tied back to Sweeney. A year later he'd moved back to London and he'd began a relationship with Delia Barmer, a nurse. The relationship lasted three years, and over those years Sweeney became increasingly abusive and controlling. Towards the end of the relationship, Sweeney tied Delia to a bed and subjected her to seven days of repeated rapes and torture. During this ordeal he would hold a gun to her head and threaten to cut out her tongue if she screamed. It was also during this ordeal that John Sweeney told Delia about the killing of Melissa Halstead and the two German men. Delia Barmer survived the week-long torture and I assumed she was too scared to go to the police initially because I found one article that says her dentist told her to report the incident after seeing the injuries to her teeth. What I think prompted her to go to the police though was when she discovered Sweeney's very own murder bag stashed under their bed. Inside the green canvas bag were rolls of masking tape, surgical gloves, a large plastic sheet and a hacksaw. I'm sure the discovery of a murder kit is terrifying at the best of times, but just put yourself in Delia's position. Imagine being trapped in a brutal relationship of psychological and physical abuse. You're alone in the house and you find this bunch of items that are clearly going to be used to dispose of a body, and then you realise he intends to use them on you. She went to the police and Sweeney was arrested. Unfortunately, because this is British police, they released him on bail and he immediately tracked down Delia Barmer. On the 22nd of December 1994, as Delia was returning home from work, John Sweeney appeared at her front door. He beat her over the head with a wooden axe handle. Then as she lay dazed on her front step, he pulled out a rusty knife and stabbed her in the breast deep enough to puncture a lung. He stabbed her again in the leg, then he picked up the axe and swung it down hard, chopping off one of her fingers. The next axe blow probably would have killed her, but a neighbour came out of his house and attacked Sweeney with a baseball bat. Delia survived the attack, but by the time police arrived on the scene, Sweeney was long gone. He managed to evade capture for another seven years, working odd jobs on building sites under a false name. During this time on the run, he murdered at least one other woman. Paula Fields was a prostitute from London who knew Sweeney. In the year 2000 she went missing, and a year later her body was found in Regent's Canal in North London. She had been cut into ten pieces with a hacksaw and placed into bin bags which were weighted down so they would sink. Her head and her hands were never recovered. There's three other women who went missing during this time, all of them with a connection to John Sweeney, but so far no other bodies have been recovered. He was eventually captured in 2001. He was working on a building site in North London, using an alias as usual. As police arrived on the site, Sweeney realised that the jig was up and he made a mad dash for his carpentry box. Police were able to stop him before he got there, and it's lucky they did, because Sweeney had one more murder kit, one that he carried with him everywhere. In his carpentry box was a loaded revolver. 
If he'd managed to get to that box before the police, then they'd never have taken him alive. After his arrest, his home was searched, and this is when they found his paintings and his poetry. They also found a load more weapons and body disposal gear. Among the items were two shotguns, another pistol, a machete and a wire garrote. It seems that Sweeney was gearing up for another murder. So that's all the time I've got for today. There were some other murder kits that I wanted to get to, but the video is running on a bit too long, so I might have to make a part two for this. I hope you found it informative anyway. At least now you know what to look out for if you find a bag full of strange objects under your partner's bed. Thanks to everyone for being patient with me over October. I know some of you were a bit disappointed that I didn't put out something for Halloween, but that's the thing with real life dramas they never really come at a convenient time so shout out to everyone supporting the channel on patreon and paypal a huge thanks to all of you as usual it really helps me put out content like this because i already know this video is going to get demonetized and uh, i don't really care at this point it's it, i just want to make the content i want to make and uh, you guys make that possible so thank you to everyone Here's some more videos you might like, check them out. The CCTV one has more info about Israel Keys, so if that story piques your interest, check that one out. Okay, until next time, goodbye.